Chapter Three of A Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Pencil Will and Miss Massey's unofficial connection with it. Each of us had a different name for the long drawn out Dilworth trial, and that name was a key to the way we wrote of it. Pert little Frank McGowan called it the War of the Widows. Both the Mrs. Dilworths were widows, but one of them was a the sort of woman who will always be known by a man's name, even after his death takes it from her. Bunnell named it a trial of temper, poor Mrs. Jim Dilworths, an undisciplined creature that, a fury, ever ready to make a scene, a scourge to every one whose interests were bound up with hers, and a wrecker of self, but not a shrew, not a nagging woman, and blessed with an open-handed, generous nature, and a laugh as hearty and spontaneous as her tears or her temper. Bliss of the male always had an allusion in his stuff to the sinister black hand. He meant the long, scrupulously scoured, knotted hand of black Mammy Sennett, Mrs. Jim's old nurse, confidant, and some even said her evil genius. As for me, I had a yearning toward the roasting of Mrs. Muriel Dilworth. I knew just how I should go about it, by dwelling on her perfections. Sweet serenity, the widow's bonnet that crowned and softened her fine regular features, the perfect taste and simplicity of her mourning, and last but not least, the lady's admirable tact and self-control, till every reader I had should hate her as I did, for adding these advantages to her social position and her wealth, and so further outclassing her poor, tempestuous, and middle-class sister-in-law. But Bowman, who knows my weakness, as he does that of everybody under him, got in first. "'No violent and aggressive championing of the underdog this time, Miss Massey,' he said. "'Wait, wait before you jump on me. I'm as hot as you are about it. It's a mighty good lay, that.' partisanship for the lowly and the erring matched against the socially lofty and beshekeled. You needn't remind your city editor, young woman, that kind hearts are more than coronets to the yellow journal, because there are so many more of them. But our respected boss has a wife who's got the society itch, and Mrs. Muriel Dilworth is way up in G, as you ought to know if you weren't a rank little bohemian. So hands off the lady, and don't, like a good girl, don't revenge yourself on the paper. If you'll play fair, I'll give you leave to get in an occasional body blow on the pure and perfect Mrs. Muriel, if you can do it without the umpire's calling foul on you. So I adopted baby Jim Dilworth and played him up. In another sense, he had already adopted me, came running to me every morning the moment he was brought into the courtroom. Perhaps you think it wasn't a compliment from a child like that, all gold and pink and blue a merry bit of human sunshine in his white dresses that Mammy Sennett kept immaculate. He was too little yet to be a real boy, but Cochran, Mrs. Jim's lawyer, Cochran the vulgar, the sensational, the shrewd and crafty and a bit off-color Cochran, kept the little one bobbing about the stuffy place for the effect of his presence upon the jury. Oh, and he was winning, that kid with his perfectly irresistible assurance of the world's breaking into smiles at sight of him. There wasn't a human being in the courtroom who could resist him, except Mrs. Muriel Dilworth. Why, even Brockington, her lawyer, old Brockington, whose fees are five-figured, whose private life's a public scandal, who's a connoisseur of fine things as well as coarse ones, and whose exquisite manners and clothes put to shame the merely western environment he honors, Brockington himself mercilessly cross-questioned Mrs. Jim Dilworth with baby Jim seated on the table before him, playing with his jeweled repeater. But, to get back to the newspaper end of it, not one of us reporters had the right name for the case, and we knew it, and everybody in the courtroom knew, too, in spite of Brockington, Cochran, and the rest, who were ever on tiptoe to anticipate and shut off the smallest allusion to it, that it was the impeccability of dead Albert Dilworth that was on trial. 
that the widows of the two brothers hated each other with a hatred passing that of mere proponent and contestant of a will, and that the paternity of this same unconscious baby, who went about the courtroom winning hearts, was in question. Why is the Dilworth case a moral spectacle and as such deserving of female patronage? Frankie McGowan scribbled on a pad that he pushed over to me. The courtroom was full of interested women spectators, and Frankie glanced about with a cynical little grin, indicating them. Give it up. Why? I wrote. Because of its deterrent effect. Phew! But the face of the transgressor is hard. Look at Mrs. Jim. I looked. Brockington was grilling her on cross-examination. With a perfection of patience, an intonation that was almost an apology for the trouble it might be to her to speak, and a flattering, courteous assumption of attention to her answers, he was yet able to sting her to a frenzy by the subtle something that underlay his every polite word. She had the look of one who is being baited, who is pushed to the extremest edge of patience. Her full breast, beneath its somewhat too ornate bodice, it looked so, contrasted with Mrs. Muriel's exquisitely simple black, heaved threateningly. Her nicely booted small foot was tapping the floor in a nervous crescendo that prophesied storms. The feathers upon her large hat were quivering as the trees in the forest quiver in anticipatory sympathy with the coming tempest and her face, usually so pale. She had a weak heart, which she overworked, McGowan insisted, playing for sympathy. Cuckheading, pathologically, Frankie called it. Her face was aflame with wrath. At the time, Mrs. Dilworth, that this, this so-called pencil will, Brockington held the disputed will delicately between thumb and finger, as one might something not quite clean, was written, where were you? At my house, she answered curtly. And Mr. Albert Dilworth, whose last will you say it is? It is, she cut him short. The old lawyer bowed. Mr. Albert Dilworth was at my house, too. Your husband, Mr. James Dilworth, was present? Mr. Brockington she burst forth explosively. You know very well that my husband was dead six months before that will was written. Ah, pardon me. I see you are correct. I had forgotten the date. The airy negligence of Brockington, and yet by this pencil will one-fourth of a half-million dollar estate was willed away from his client to the golden-haired boy just now dancing in Mammy Sennett's arms. That isn't true! Mrs. Jim cried hysterically. You did, you did know the date. Madam? The judge turned to her. It was not the first time she had been reproved, and now, as with every other time it had happened, one could see by the quick, angry glance she cast at Mrs. Muriel's discreetly lowered head wherein the bitterness of reproof lay. Well, she stammered like a child, trying to justify herself. It isn't the truth. What kind of a lawyer is he if— One assumes, madam, her plight and the impossibility of her behaving like an ordinary woman appealed to the judge. His voice was still gentle, though tried. One assumes that an attorney speaks the truth. In any event, it is not your place to accuse the gentleman. Merely answer his questions. I will, she said sullenly, when there's any sense to them. The judge lifted his hand. His eyes were angry. I trembled for bad Mrs. Jim at that moment. Er, Your Honor, Brockington interposed with distinguished grace. The lady is, of course, quite right. I must apologize. But the so-called pencil will. He tapped it deprecatingly, gingerly with his eyeglasses. Is so obvious, a forgery to an attorney, of course, that I have given it too little consideration. Mr. Stenographer, be so good as to read the last question. I won't answer it, she cried. I have answered it. She looked as though she could no longer contain herself. She half rose from her chair, as though determined to fall upon her tormentor, 
but she sat down quickly, both hands at her heart. The heart pose, McGowan called it. Thank you, thank you. Brockington was gracefully oblivious. He waved the shorthand man into silence and waved the quite unnecessary question. Mrs. Dilworth, kindly tell the court and the jury in what room you were when Mr. Albert Dilworth wrote this alleged will. I was in my bedroom. Mrs. Dilworth's voice was low, even weak. Was it rage or really heart trouble? And he, Mr. Albert Dilworth, was in the sitting-room beyond. An open archway between? An open archway between. You say you were ill at the time. I was ill. My baby was a few days old. Ah, the little fellow. Hold the child up, if you please, Mrs. Sennett, that the jury may see him. It was Brockington's ostentatious way of calling Cochrane's attention to the fact that he did not fear little Jim's influence. Mrs. Sennett, if you please. But Mrs. Sennett did not please. It was evident in a moment to us reporters who knew her that Mammy didn't even please to be conscious of Mr. Brockington's presence, and that she was determined to be deaf to his voice. Mrs. Jim interposed, a smile in her voice at her nurse's partisanship. It must have been sweet to her. She was so alone, while surrounding and upholding Mrs. Muriel was a group of ultra-respectables, women who were good form personified, good form in morals, in manners, in costume. "'That's the child, Mr. Brockington,' Mrs. Jim said with a sneer. "'The jury has seen him all right, Baby Jim.' "'What? Mom?' It was Jim's clear little trill. The child, hearing his name, had piped out the query, and the woman on the stand smiled back at him responsively, but putting a finger to her lip. I swear she was positively sweet in that minute. "'Look, Frankie, look!' I whispered. Look at her now and see if your saintly Mrs. Muriel is half as much a woman. But Brockington had begun again. You swear, madam, that you saw Mr. Albert Dilworth write this, uh, will? There was delicate unbelief in Brockington's tone. No, I don't. I swore that he sat writing something in my sitting room when... Pardon me. With a pencil, Mrs. Dilworth? Mr. Albert Dilworth writing with a pencil a formal document of this sort? It was a strain to put one's credulity to, to fancy that hard-headed, highly respected martinet, Albert Dilworth, doing anything so informal and irregular as making a pencil will. I, I couldn't see what he was writing with, she answered resentfully. He was writing something, and when he had finished he came in to me. Precisely. And where were you? I have told you, she exclaimed explosively. I was in bed in my bedroom. Mr. Brockington paused to place his eyeglasses carefully on his nose. It was an old trick of his to postpone and to accentuate a situation. He knew every eye was upon him. You say, Mrs. Dilworth, that Mr. Albert Dilworth came into your bedroom where you lay with your infant and that he told you of the will he had made? He didn't say will. He said, Don't worry about the boy, Etta. I have provided for him. Did he say why? Why? The color left her face. She was ghastly pale. Why he should provide for another's child? She came back at him quick, then. She was not a cruel woman though she was almost everything else that a woman wouldn't want to be, but she had suffered too much to let this chance pass. He was childless and very lonely, she said slowly. She didn't need to turn her eyes toward the side where Mrs. Muriel sat. A sixth feminine sense must have made her aware that she had pierced the one vulnerable spot in her enemy's armor. Brockington looked at the witness almost admiringly. He had known Mr. Albert Dilworth, the conventional, the conservative, cold-blooded banker. Of such depths of sentiment no one had suspected him. 
he would have smiled himself at the picture Mrs. Jim's words called up. It was nonsense, of course. Even the judge passed a discreet hand over his incredulously upturned lips. But she perjured herself like a goose, and then went on like a woman to make it thorough. He was very, very fond of children, she continued sentimentally. Etta, he said as he came in from the sitting room, all my married life I have longed for a son. I'll take care of yours now. But retribution came quick in the very moment of her triumph. Mrs. Dilworth, Brockington pounced upon her in a flash. I call your attention to page 15 of the transcript of your testimony, in that you testify that Mr. Albert Dilworth said to you, Don't worry about the boy, Etta. I have provided for him and that he said not one word more, not one word more. Her eyes flew to her attorney. Cochrane had been doing everything short of shouting to her to attract her attention, but in her ecstasy of revenge she had forgotten him. It was too late now. Madam, persisted Brockington, may I ask you to explain the discrepancy? She thought for a moment. She was not a stupid woman but when her emotions were aroused she saw things cloudily. "'If it please the court,' began Cochrane, sparring for time. But Brockington wouldn't have it. He fought then earnestly, no play-acting about it, and he won his point. "'I—I I was wrong, then,' Mrs. Jim faltered at last. "'When, pray?' "'The first time. He did say that about being childless.' Then you deliberately deceived the court and this jury in a most important particular. Madam, do you know the penalty of perjury? I object. Cochrane jumped to his feet, dancing with impatience, with apprehension. He made quite a little speech then, did Cochrane, in his own atrocious style, and Brockington said never a word in answer, only waited a bit too politely, and noiselessly snapping his fingers, a habit of his, for the judge's decision. Then he resumed. Mrs. Dilworth, why did you conceal these facts, these remarks of Mr. Albert Dilworth, to you? For a moment she looked at him warily. Then something occurred to her. I left that out, she said sweetly, to spare Mr. Dilworth's widow. I thought it would hurt her. She was quite right. It would. It did. Mr. Dilworth's widow's bonnet sank as though with a weight, and the lorgnette she was holding to her short-sighted eyes fell with a click. Brockington saw the movement out of the corner of his eye. It was the first time his client had flinched. "'Is this the truth this time?' he asked unpleasantly. "'Or will this, too, be amended later?' Again her lawyer came to Mrs. Jim's rescue. She needed him. Her color was rising, and all the storm signals flew from her flashing eyes. "'And why, Mrs. Dilworth, does your gracious forbearance end now?' Brockington asked, when things were quiet again. "'Why do you not the same reasons still hold good as to sparing the lady?' There was a silence, tense and anxious. What would she say? What could she say? Her eyes fell. She bit her lip. She began to speak, then fell silent, and Brockington waited, standing, with insulting patience. She, she hasn't spared me, Mrs. Jim blurted out at last, but even on her own ears the words fell jangled. Oh, I, I don't know, she added. It just happened to come to me. Brockington was silent, just a long, significant second to let the words carry their own weight of venom to the juror's ears. "'Ah, just a bit of revenge, then,' he murmured, as though indulgently musing aloud, and then quickly, "'Have you told any one of these supplementary remarks of Mr. Albert Dilworth?' N "'No. It wasn't revenge, Mr. Brockington.' "'Have you not even told your confidant, Mrs. Sinnott?' I say it wasn't revenge, Mr. Brockington, she repeated, blindly stubborn now. Mr. Albert Dilworth, Brockington went on, composedly ignoring her, 
had nieces whom he loved, his sister's children. Did he say, Mrs. Dilworth, why he intended to provide for your boy and not for them? She set her teeth and merely looked at him, dumb with exasperation. Will the stenographer please read the question? asked Brockington with superb irrelevance. I must ask your honor to instruct the witness to answer the question. I will not, I will not, cried Mrs. Jim in a fury now, dissatisfaction with herself for putting a weapon in his hands, augmenting her rage at her tormentor. He shan't insult me, he shan't browbeat me. Mine has been gracious forbearance, and he knows it in spite of his sneers. But he don't appreciate it. It's at an end now. I won't play the game their way any more. I don't care what happens. I'll produce that. This far she had fought her way in spite of Cochrane's strenuous objections, the judge's grave commands, and Brockington's insistently courteous, If the court please. But the rest of it was inaudible. The judge's, Will the stenographer kindly repeat the last question, came out of the turmoil like the theme out of a fugue. But this time Mrs. Jim's face lit up at the sound of it. She hardly waited for the clerk to finish. "'Why shouldn't he provide for my boy?' she cried, instead of those snobbish nieces of his. "'Why shouldn't he provide for him? Baby Jim Dilworth is his own.' "'Mom! Mom!' It was the child's voice that stopped her. She looked toward it. Right across from her at the back wall of the courtroom, the tall old black mammy had stationed herself, with the boy high in her arms. Beside the gold and pink of his head, her gaunt features looked grim and disapproving. For half a second, Mrs. Jim met those hollow black eyes and battled with them. "'Nephew! His twin brother's child!' she concluded lamely, and burst into hysterical tears. As we sat waiting in Mrs. Jim Dilworth's little parlor that evening, half a dozen of us reporters, she came storming in, tearing off her gloves and coat as she walked, a creature of temperament, strongly emotional, caught in the cold steel meshes of the law and floundering miserably. "'Well, what is it?' she demanded, facing us. We'd interviewed her dozens of times, but never without old Mammy Sennett standing guard over her. "'You want me to tell what they wouldn't let me tell on the stand? Well, I'm going to. You can have it all, every word of it. The whole lot of you. I don't care if every paper in town is full of it. They've made me desperate now, and they can take the consequences. Here!' She drew a much-folded paper from her blouse. I reached up to take it. I happened to be nearest, and I saw Albert Dilworth's signature on it, when the folding doors opened and old Mammy Sennett came in. I watched the change that came over the men's faces. Checkmate, it said. My own face must have looked enough like theirs to establish a pen and ink relationship. Is that you, honey? Oh, the sweetness in that old darky's voice. She came forward to take Mrs. Jim's things from her, but she stood a moment caressing her hand. You must be tired, but won't you go into Jim for a minute? He's restless. That old cot room's mighty bad for a baby. Mrs. Jim hesitated, and we held our breath. She knew, and we knew, how much more than solicitude for the child lay behind the old negress's words. You'd be furious yourself, Mammy, if you'd been treated as I have, she cried. But there was uncertainty in her voice. Yes, honey, guess I'd just naturally spill over myself. But these gemmen will wait for you, Miss Etta, I'm sure. The men murmured, but Mammy affected not to hear, and before they could speak, she turned to me. "'You'll wait, won't you, miss?' she asked. "'You're always so fond of Jim. He's got your handkerchief that you made into a mouse for him in his hand now. He's mighty stuck on you.' Bliss loves to write about Mammy Sennett's hypnotic eye. He had actually run a story that afternoon in the mail, to the effect that the old black woman had forged the pencil will and hypnotized Mrs. Jim into believing it genuine. It may have been my remembrance of this working suggestively, but I could have sworn there was a special appeal, almost that and a promise besides, 
and the old woman's cavernous eyes as she turned them upon me. "'Why, certainly,' I said, and I heard Bunnell swear under his breath. "'Mrs. Dilworth will see us soon?' "'Oh, course, of course,' said the old woman soothingly. "'Soon's he's asleep, eh, Miss Etta? Shall I keep the paper till you'll come out?' Mrs. Jim nodded, put the folded paper into the long black fingers that closed greedily over it, and left the room. She faced us then, stern and grim and defiant, mammy against the lot of us. "'Yo reporters is just another kind of bloodhound,' she snarled. "'Yo ain't got the reason the police has to hunt a man down. Yo don't do it for love or money, but just cause yo's hounds and nothing else. Yo kill for the sake of killin'. It don't do yo no good. What's that woman inside done to yo? What right yo got to come snoopin' in her, trying to ferret her secrets out? Ain't it enough that the code is against her and the biggest lawyers in the city being paid out her own money? Money it ought to be her boys, anyhow, without yo comin' in and houndin' her to death? Think shame to yourselves. You, most of any of em. Yes, you, they calls Rody Massey. Phew! That was straight from the shoulder. Why? I gasped, while the men grinned, enjoying it usually. The truth can't hurt her. That's a lie right there. You know it can hurt, and you want her to hurt herself. You know she's hot-tempered and uncareful. She don't mince her words like some that thinks they's so stylish. She just comes right out, and yo, yo lying in wait, the jackal lot of you, to get hold of anything. Why don't yo ask me questions? Old Mammy'll give yo as good as you send. Mrs. Sennett, I jumped in in a sweetly casual tone. Won't you kindly tell us the contents of the paper you have in your hand? A gleam of humor came into her sunken black eyes. Oh, yo's mighty ready, yo little sass box. Pity yo ain't had old Mammy to spank yo good when yo was littler, she growled, but almost tenderly. But the roar those men set up. They were having the time of their lives. Even Cohen stopped sketching the gaunt old woman in her plain black gown and big white apron to join in the chorus. It was in the midst of it that she had leaned toward me, and I just caught her whisper. Get him away, child. For God's sakes, get him away for Miss Etta comes back. You won't lose. When I want you, she spoke aloud now, for the men had stopped laughing to listen. When I want you, Rody Massey, I'll send for you. Oh, the imperiousness in that black woman's voice. It did make me feel like a child. That, Miss Massey, sniggered Frank McGowan, is a delicate mode of intimating that, so far as you're concerned, the audience is over. I looked at him a minute but I wasn't hearing him or seeing him. It was Mammy that was pictured in my mind. Old Mammy Sennett, who had never broken a promise, every newspaper man in town knew that, and who never forgot a kindness. I guess that's about the size of it, Frankie. I sighed, shrugging my shoulders and walking away. You're not giving it up, he asked, amazed, following me to the door where Bliss lazily joined us. But I made no reply, and as they stood for a second talking, I saw Mammy, in a swift pantomime, make some agreement with Bunnell. It was done quick as a flash, so quick that I'd have distrusted my own eyes if Bunnell hadn't risen just then and walked out past us. "'I say, what's up?' cried McGowan. "'Nothing's up,' Bunnell said indifferently. Mrs. Jim's down, gone to bed, and I'm not wasting time tackling Mammy Sennett for a story. He turned with a grin and ran downstairs. I knew that grin. It made me uneasy, and I hesitated for another minute. When I want yo, Rody Massey, I'll send for yo. The shrewd old negress had read me in a moment. Ain't that plain? It was. It had to be. There was a big chance in it anyway and I took it. "'Are you coming my way, Frankie?' I asked. "'Good night, Mrs. Sennett.' She nodded curtly at the lot of us standing now out in the hall, closed the door quickly behind us, and bolted it. Something in the action roused McGowan's suspicions. "'I'm not going,' 
he said. Think I'll camp out for the night right here. Bliss lit a cigarette. Enderby of the Express took out his pipe, and they both sat down on the steps below him. They were still perched there when I turned up the street. But I didn't sleep well that night. Bunnell's grin haunted me. I dreamed all night that I was scooped, unmercifully scooped. I saw the Times Record's first page all broken out in 102 type. And though I knew it was a smashing Dilworth story, I couldn't read a line of it to find out what it was about. For Bunnell's face, with the grin still on it, seemed to be printed life-size behind it all over the page. I was sick with apprehension when I waked, so strong was the impression left by that nasty nightmare. I flew to the door and got the Times record, and there, sure enough, spread out even blacker and bigger than my worst dreams, and under a screaming headline. Mammy Sennett confesses to a Times record reporter, the pencil will is a forgery, was a Dilworth story that would shake the town. It did. All San Francisco roared, with laughter, for that precious old rascal of a colored woman had confided in four different reporters, differently. She told Bunnell that the will was a forgery and that Mrs. Jim knew it was. She confessed to Bliss, calling him in for the purpose from the landing, that the will was a forgery, but that Mrs. Jim innocently supposed it was genuine. She gave Enderby solemn assurance that the will was genuine and that she had secret evidence corroborating it. And she wisely chose little Frank McGowan for her confidant in the last variation, that the will was a forgery, but that it was a true and faithful copy of a genuine will that had been lost. Perhaps you think Rhoda Massey didn't hug herself and have the laugh on those bewildered men when, on the stand the next morning, Mammy was questioned about her various interviews and responded with only a twinkle in the depths of her inscrutable black eyes. "'Tain't no lie to lie to a newspaper reporter that's getting a living by telling lies.'" When old Brockington's sins are forgotten, and the scandals of which he is the hero have passed out of newspaper men's memory, which is tenacious, they'll still tell of the great speech he made in the Dilworth case. I sat not ten feet from him while he was addressing the jury in the last throes of the great struggle. The case had been on for months, and people crowded the courtroom, sitting crushed together in intense stillness to listen to the arguments at the end. And though I couldn't help seeing through the actor's arts, though I knew his declamatory tricks and was so familiar with the case that I could almost anticipate the points he made, in spite of this he thrilled me. And not me alone. I saw the young wife of a great theatrical manager, beautiful Evelyn Lowenthal, for whom Brockington had provided seats at his own table, her wonderful violet eyes fixed upon the attorney while he spoke, with a fascinated intentness like that she herself used to bring to the faces of those who saw her on the stage before her marriage. And I saw Jerome Kirby, who was there with her, of course. Kirby, the debonair, the graceful and brave and reckless. I saw Kirby's handsome, cynical face go gray, and I heard the rending of his gloves when Brockington began to speak of the accursed interloper who makes marriage a mockery. Was Brockington killing two cuckoos with one stone? Was he flaying the enemy of his old friend Lowenthal with the same lash and over the shrinking back of Mrs. Jim? I don't know. I was shivering with excitement when he turned the thing over to the jury at last and took his seat. I couldn't look at Mrs. Jim. To turn a curious eye upon a thing on the rack as she was was too inhuman. She fainted once during the terrible arraignment. McGowan insisted that it was done for effect, but I caught Mammy Sennett's eye as she bent over her applying restoratives, and I saw the agonized truth behind it. When the jury retired and the courtroom cleared, she was still sitting with her hand on her heart, her eyes staring from out a pallid face as though she were in a stupor. She did not notice when little Jim left her side, and ran to me, lifting his arms and crying, "'Take! Take Jim!' I looked over then at Mammy. "'Let me take him for a while, till she's feeling better,' I said. "'Ain't you going downtown to your work now?' she asked hesitatingly. 
I shook my head, and a grayish pallor seemed to settle like a veil over her black skin. Yo reckon it'll be soon, then, the verdict? Everybody seems to think so, I said gently. That means it'll be against Miss Etta? I tried to evade and to hide my face behind Jim's golden curls, but you couldn't, with those fierce old eyes upon you, tell anything but the truth. The whole courtroom, now that the judge had withdrawn, was humming with it. McGowan was offering odds that the verdict rejecting the pencil will would be brought in within half an hour. "'Well, take him, then,' Mammy's voice was hard. "'But don't you be so sure, miss, and one thing I tell you now, if they do down Miss Etta this time, it'll be cause the biggest piece of evidence wasn't put in, and you can say that old Mammy Senate'll spend every dollar she's got to see her lamb righted, and no hatched-up business between lawyers will stop her. No, you needn't look at me that way. I never cheated you, did I? I tell you it's the truth. Then prove it, Mrs. Senate, I said quickly, but under my breath so that none of those about could hear. Do you think any editor in town will dare to print anything from you now after— Oh, won't he? she snarled. Won't he print that if he can get it? She pulled a piece of paper from her satchel, and I almost dropped small Jim Dilworth to the floor. It was the paper Mrs. Jim had flaunted in our eyes the night we all went to interview her, and it made me feel now like a little repertorial donkey before whose nose and just out of reach the most tempting wisp of hay is being pulled along. "'Now look here, Mammy Sennett,' I began angrily. "'Shh! Look here yourself. I'm a-going to give it to you.' I promised myself I would that night yo got out when I told you to. If the jury say that will ain't a true one, yo having this now won't hurt us, for we'll fight it out in a higher court and we'll use it next time. But if the jury say the pencil will's truly Albert Dilworth's, it won't, Mrs. Sennett. It's as sure as. Then you won't mind promising me if the jury decides for Miss Etta that you won't print this paper. I'll take your word, your promise, eh? Promise? Who wouldn't promise on a sure thing like that? There in my shaking hand was a written acknowledgment of the boy's paternity. I commend the child known as Jim Dilworth to my wife Muriel. He is my son. There it was in black and white, and not pencil this time, signed Albert Dilworth and dated scrupulously, the heart of the Dilworth case at last beating in sight of the world. Mammy watched me grimly. I want yo to say, if you do put it in the paper, that Mammy Sennett saw Albert Dilworth write that paper, that she told him if he didn't write it she'd tell that stuck-up wife of his the whole bad story before he died, that she kept it out of this here trial to save Miss Etta's name, but that if my lamb don't get his rights through the pencil wheel he'll get em this way or my name ain't Mammy Sennett. Mind yo promise now. She turned back to Mrs. Jim. I danced out into the hall, Jim in my arms. He crowed and clapped his hands at the motion, but he wasn't a bit happier than I. Think what a story. Think what a scoop. Think. There was a stir in the hall ahead of me. It was Brockington, ushering his client into the judge's chambers, from which he and the judge came out immediately and went out to luncheon together. Oh, think what Mrs. Muriel would say to the document I held in my hand. Oh, I must, I simply had to be the first to tell her of it. If the one forlorn chance in a thousand should give Mrs. Jim the victory, her secret would be as safe with her proud sister-in-law as with Mammy herself. If the jury brought in the verdict everybody expected, Mrs. Muriel would know the story anyway as soon as the news came out. So she might as well know it now and from me. I'd heard the lock click behind Brockington and the judge when they came out, so with Jim still on my arm I hurried back into the courtroom, up behind the judge's chair, and in a minute I'd pushed open the other door and stood in Mrs. Muriel's presence. It didn't seem like a presence, though. The great lady's bonnet was off, her brown hair was prettily mussed, and her head lay bowed on the desk before her. She was crying, crying just like an ordinary human woman. She looked up quickly at the noise Jim chose to make just then, trumpeting through his fists. "'I beg your pardon, Mrs. Dilworth,' 
I said in a rush. I have just got possession of a document that concerns you deeply, and— You will please excuse me, she said. Her voice was still husky with tears. They made it sound strangely soft, very different from the cold, contained utterance we'd heard from the stand. On my lawyer's advice I have declined, as I supposed you knew, to speak to anyone connected with the newspapers. If you will see Mr. Brockington or Mr. Hewlett, Look, Mrs. Dilworth. I let Jim slip to the floor and held the paper before her. Mechanically she felt for her lorgnette, but before she could get it her short-sighted eyes had recognized the signature. And then, then Mrs. Jim Dilworth came tearing in like a whirlwind. You, you give me back that paper. What right have you got to show it to her? She cried. And then a second before I could think to hide it, she snatched it out of my hand and stormed out again, catching Jim up in a passion that made him hold tight as though the arm he rode was a ship and a typhoon. I turned, hopeless, to Mrs. Muriel. "'I assure you,' I began. But she waved apology aside. "'Tell me,' she interrupted eagerly. "'Won't you tell me what was in that paper? It is his signature, my husband's name. I caught only that. My eyes are so wretched. I—I I, will you please tell me? No, I wouldn't. I couldn't, now. For this wasn't the Mrs. Muriel Dilworth I had been watching week after week in the courtroom, with her unchangeable composure, her pitiless ignoring of the other woman. The Mrs. Muriel who dwelt on cold, inaccessible heights where humanity's cries couldn't reach her. Perhaps, Mrs. Dilworth, I stammered, this paper may be a forgery, too. She shook her head. That was Mr. Dilworth's writing. I know it. I am positive. Oh! Suddenly her voice broke and the tears rolled unhidden down her cheeks. Do you realize what I am enduring? How I am groping helplessly for the truth? I... I'm sorry, I began but at that moment the door opened behind us and the judge walked in. "'They've reached a verdict, ladies,' he said. "'The jury will be in in a moment.' I jumped for the door. "'Miss Massey, please!' It was Mrs. Muriel's voice, appealing, insistent. "'But the jury—' "'What difference does that make?' she cried. "'I don't want the money. I want the truth. I want—' "'Here comes Mr. Hewlett,' I put in eagerly. "'Mr. Brockington must have sent him for you.' She wrung her hands. "'You cruel girl,' she sobbed. "'Has your profession made you utterly heartless?' N no I protested, capitulating. I had to speak in a whisper, for Brockington's young partner was nearly upon us. "'This is what the paper says.' I commend the child known as Jim Dilworth to my wife Muriel. He is... He is not my son. I couldn't help it. Up to the instant before I reached the last two words it hadn't occurred to me. But with that quivering woman standing before me, I fell down like the miserable little coward I am. When I got to the door of the courtroom I found it so crowded that, instead of going to the reporter's desk, I let the bailiff make way for me to the first empty chair. From where I sat I couldn't hear the words in which the foreman mumbled his verdict, but I caught a glimpse of poor Mrs. Jim's face, white, drawn, incredulous, and agonized, before she fell defeated into Mammy's arms. It was just then that Mrs. Muriel entered. She passed her lawyer's table and came swiftly toward the spot where Mammy sat, chafing Mrs. Jim's hands and holding her heavy head to her breast. Etta. Mrs. Muriel's voice was shaken still, but it was whispered music, so thrilling it was with the humility of utter happiness. Forgive me, Etta. The boy shall have all this and more. He'll be my son as well as yours if you will let me share him with you, whatever the verdict is. The verdict is already in, Mrs. Dilworth, Hewlett's voice broke in. He had followed her. We have won. Let me be first to congratulate you. But she hardly heard him. Etta, she pleaded, putting out a hand to Mrs. Jim's shoulder. 
Go away, you! Mammy's eyes blazed furiously up at her. You've half killed her. Instinctively, Mrs. Muriel fell back before the savage ferocity of the black woman's face. She might have yielded then to the pressure of her lawyer's hand, but suddenly she felt a tug at her skirt. It was Jim, lost, forgotten in the excitement of the moment, yet suffering intuitively, feeling and fearing the crisis. "'Take!' he cried with a trembling lip, lifting his arms to her. "'Take Jim!' She bent down and lifted him, holding his sobbing little body with a tenderness and yet a yielding strength that transfigured her. Through the crowd Cochran made his way with a glass of whiskey. Mammy put it to Mrs. Jim's blue lips, then let it fall crashing to the floor. "'She dead! My God! Miss Etta! Miss Etta!' Her black hand crept to Mrs. Jim's heart, then in a second it lifted, nodded and threatening, over Muriel Dilworth's head. "'You! You!' the old woman stammered thickly. But baby Jim, his blond head curled into the lady's neck, turned his wet blue eyes wonderingly upon Mammy, and lifting a hand like a dimpled snowflake, he touched the black woman's lips with a pleading caress. That same little tender hand still holds back the real, the awful vengeance Mammy Sennett might take if she would. It holds me back, too, though the office would fire me in a minute if it's suspected, and serve me right, too. But since Mrs. Muriel has legally adopted the boy, what good on earth would be served by wrecking a live woman's faith and dragging a dead woman's name from under the sheltering benefit of the doubt? End of chapter 3